This book began with a phone call from Elizabeth Hudson, who is the editor of Our State Magazine, which goes out all across the South. I think about a quarter of a million people read it. And she said, I have an idea. The, the uh, sesquicentennial, the 150th of the Civil War, is approaching, and we would like you to do a piece on the Civil War, kind of a narrative piece. And I said, well, I don't know anything at all about the Civil War. I was raised in Delaware. Our war was the American Revolution, the Brandywine Battlefield and such. And a bunch of historians, two of whom have actually blurbed this book. And she said, yeah, but we want you because you're ignorant. <laughs> In so many words. Now, I always tell my writers that the only, the two things you have to have as a writer, and you have to have both, and you'll shortly understand why, but the two things you absolutely need as a writer are ignorance and curiosity. If you just have ignorance, that's not going to get you very far. And if you just have sort of undirected curiosity, what you really need is something that you want to find out about. Not writing what you know, but writing what you really want to find out about. And as I, as I dug into this and started looking at the Civil War in North Carolina, I realized, A, there is no state better positioned to become a lens for the entire war, not just what happened in North Carolina, than North Carolina. Because North Carolina troops were involved in pretty much every important battle you can think of. A North Carolinian ascended to the White House after Lincoln was shot, Raleigh native, Andrew Johnson. We in North Carolina hosted the one big insurgent group that was fighting the Confederacy, the Heroes of America, 10,000 people headquartered just down the street from the State House in Raleigh. We had Quakers who were against the war. We had Moravians who were against the war, but who provided excellent musicians to the 26th Regiment. We had Cherokees. The Eastern Band of Cherokee actually declared their allegiance to the Confederacy and were fighting in the mountains under the first white chief, the only white chief they had, William Holland Thomas. So you have amazing things going on. And then you also have a little guy named William Tecumseh Sherman, who I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, he marched uh, through here, as I recall. <laughs> Left his calling card at the Fayetteville Observer, in fact. His calling card being the torches that uh, followed him on his march. But what I want to do is I want to read a little bit about him, and then I'm going to sing you a couple of songs. Because one of the things that I try to do in my writing projects is to figure out how best to gain empathy with people who are all place, time, experience that I am, and to try to imagine my way into their interior life and figure out what in the world they were all about. So I'll try a couple of songs on you when we're done here, and, and then I'll be happy to entertain any questions. We can talk about anything that you would like. Okay, so when Sherman got, from Savannah, got to Savannah from Atlanta, and which is the, the great march everybody talks about, what he wrote about it in his memoirs, he said, you know, the march to the sea seems to have captivated everyone but it was child's play compared to the other. The other was the one he undertook from Savannah to Goldsboro, then to Raleigh, Durham, and finally the great surrender that really ended the war. All that stuff you read about Appomattox, not so much. So it begins in disobedience, as you'll hear. He's ordered to, to put his troops on boats, send them up on ships to join Grant's army, and he says no. Any other general in the army would have been cashiered and relieved of command, but he was Grant's best friend. So instead of saying, you're relieved of command, Grant says, what else do you want to do? And he tells him. And this is the story about what he tells him. And as you'll see when we get to the end of this little chapter, it also ends in disobedience. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But it also ends in friendship, a different kind of friendship than the one it began in. Sherman's final march. He's a plain boy named by his parents William Tecumseh, the middle name after the fearsome Indian war chief from his native Ohio. When the boy is just nine years old and his father dies suddenly leaving behind 11 children, he's taken in by a family friend, Thomas Ewing, a politician and lawyer. Ewing arranges for the boy to receive an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, where his fellow cadets, including a champion rider called Sam Grant, nickname him Cump the name by which his friends will call him ever after. And the staunchest of those friends will be Grant. He grows up to be a man of average height and wiry build, recognizable by his receding, unkempt red hair and beard, and the intensity of his glaring eyes. He's smart, nervous, speaks in quick, often ill-tempered outbursts. His attention darts from one idea to another. He writes almost compulsively, candid, passionate, even intemperate letters. 
Like his friend Grant, he takes up the habit of cigars and smokes furiously, lighting the next cigar off the glowing butt of the one still in his teeth. When he's 30 years old, he marries Ewing's daughter, Ellen. By the time South Carolina secedes from the Union, Sherman has long since resigned his U.S. Army commission and done stints as a banker and a manager. At last, in Alexandria, Louisiana, he finds his calling, superintendent of the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. Great title, I always love that. He intends to bring his wife, Ellen, and their three children from Ohio to settle permanently there. He loves the South and his no moral compunctions at all about slavery. I would not, if I could, abolish or modify slavery, he tells his brother-in-law. I don't know that I would materially change the relation of masters and slaves. Negroes in the great numbers that exist here must, of necessity, be slaves. In the contentious presidential election of 1860, he does not vote for Abraham Lincoln. He does not vote at all. But when the state secedes, he speaks plainly and prophetically. I see every chance of a long, confused, and disorganized civil war, and I feel no desire to take a hand therein. He admonishes a pro-secession faculty member at the academy. You, the people of the South, believe there can be such a thing as peaceable secession. You don't know what you're doing. He goes on. The country will be trenched in blood. Oh, it is all folly, madness, a crime against civilization. The South's cause is hopeless from the start, he maintains. The North can forge steam engines, and the South can hardly make a pair of shoes. You are rushing into war and one of the mo with one of the most powerful, ingeniously mechanical, and determined people on Earth, right at your doors. You are bound to fail. Worse, to Sherman, secession is treason. He resigns his teaching post and heads north. There's nothing in his character, background, or training to indicate that in a very short time he will command a relentless and disciplined army of veterans, liberate tens of thousands of slaves, and write the final chapter of the war. But in the winter of 1864-65, having reclaimed an officer's commission and risen quickly to command the Victorian Union armies in the West, he conceives a bold plan to restage his army in the East and support Grant's final move on the Army of Northern Virginia. It is, in fact, his signature asset, the ability to go all in, to go for broke, to risk everything on a bold move and then follow through on it come hell or high water, and he will see plenty of both. He cuts a wide path across Georgia from Atlanta to the coast, systematically destroying any resource that can aid the enemy. In his armies wake lie the ruins of railroads, storehouses, bridges, government buildings, and even homes, though far fewer than he will be accused of later. He presents Savannah to President Lincoln as a Christmas present. Grant wires him to ferry his army up the coast on transport ships, but Sherman calculates that will take two full months. And on his arrival, many of his troops will be weak and sickened from the sea voyage. He proposes to Grant instead that he turn north and march his army towards southern Virginia. We can punish South Carolina as she deserves, and as thousands of the people in Georgia hope we would do, he argues. I do sincerely believe that the whole United States, North and South, would rejoice to have my army turned loose on South Carolina to devastate the state in the manner we have done in Georgia. And it would have a direct and immediate bearing on the campaign in Virginia. He will lead his combined forces, the Army of the Tennessee and the Army of Georgia, more than 60,000 strong, 450 miles through Fayetteville, site of one of the Confederacy's last arsenals, to Goldsboro. There, at the junction of the Wilmington and Weldon and the Atlantic and North Carolina, he can refit his army, then move on Virginia. On Christmas Eve, 1864, as the first naval shells are exploding against Fort Fisher, Sherman receives Grant's telegram. March. Sherman spends a month calling out the sick and wounded, procuring fresh horses and mules, and restocking ammunition, food, and medical supplies. His quartermaster and commissary train of 2,500 wagons is freighted with plenty of ammunition, but carries just 20 days' rations. After that, he will live off the country. Mostly, his troops are men who re-enlisted after hard campaigning. The slackers and green conscripts are long gone. 
and they regard their commander as invincible, almost godlike. One soldier writes, there never was such a man as Sherman, or as they call him, Crazy Bill, and he has got his men to believe that he can't be whipped. On February 1st, Sherman's army begins its inexorable progress north. It pushes up the coast in two wings. Major General Oliver Otis Howard commands the right wing and the Army of, Ten of the Tennessee. Major General Henry Warner Slocum commands the left wing, the Army of Georgia. Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick, called Little Kill, commands the cavalry, about 4,400 troopers, many of them armed with repeating carbines that can deliver massive firepower against single-shot muskets. Sherman's, ar Sherman's army surges through the low country in a track 40 to 50 miles wide. The wagon trains drawn by 10,000 mules nose to tailboard for 25 miles. Pointing his wings in a Y formation with a reserve held in the center, Sherman feints toward both Charleston and Augusta, forcing the Confederates to defend both cities. But instead, he arrows due north for Columbia, the capital, the seat of secession, and the home of General Joseph E. Johnston. Over the strenuous objections of Jefferson Davis, Confederate General-in-Chief Robert E. Lee has called on Johnston to stop Sherman. Johnston writes, be assured that knight of old never fought under his king more loyally than I'll serve under General Lee. Like many Confederates, Lieutenant General William J. Hardy, commander of Charleston, doesn't believe Sherman's army can possibly forge a road through the low country swamps. But Johnston knows his old stubborn adversary better. When I learn that Sherman's army is marching through the Salkahatchee swamps, making its own corduroy road at the rate of a dozen miles a day and more, and bringing its artillery and wagons with it, I made up my mind there had been no such army in existence since the days of Julius Caesar. The going is torturous in steady rain, but time and again the pioneers rise to the task, hauling the wagons out of mud, shouldering limbers and cannons across creeks, chopping trees, and laying down the ever-lengthening corduroy roads. Meanwhile, Kilpatrick's cavalry runs rampant across the countryside, burning houses and stores, and the legions of bummers strip the countryside clean of livestock, grain, and any valuables they can find. Columbia falls with barely a fight, and the first blue troops rush in, skirmishing with Wade Hampton's retreating cavalry. And there, one of the most shameful episodes of the war plays out, inciting recriminations and accusations and denials for the rest of Sherman's lifetime. Columbia burns. Cotton bales are fired by either Hampton's cavalry or U.S. soldiers, and then more fires are ignited by free Union prisoners and other blue coats. Because Columbia was thought safe from the advancing Union army, its warehouses and homes are stuffed with all kinds of goods brought there for safekeeping, including hundreds of barrels of whiskey and thousands of bottles of wine and brandy. The occupying troops lose all discipline and degenerate into a drunken mob on a spree. They loot and burn private homes and shops, the Methodist church, even the Ursuline convent. A number of them seize enslaved girls and women, rape them in gangs, beat them, even kill them afterwards. Sherman's conclusion about the burning of Columbia is characteristically candid. Though I never ordered it and I never wished it, I've never shed any tears over the event because I believe it hastened what we all fought for, the end of the war. On February 20th, Sherman resumes his march. Soon his army crosses into North Carolina to Sherman, a friendlier country. A member of his staff writes, our men seem to understand they're entering a state which has suffered for his Union sentiment and whose inhabitants would gladly embrace the old flag again if they can have the opportunity. Sherman now orders restraint. Slocum counsels his subordinates, it should not be assumed that the inhabitants are enemies to our government, and it is to be hoped that every effort was made to present any wanton destruction of property or any unkind treatment of citizens. The army and his livestock is as necessary as ever. Strict protocols are now in force. Soldiers are forbidden from entering private homes under any circumstances. Only food, livestock, and forage for horses and mules may be commandeered. But among the contraband of war are naval stores, tar, pitch, and turpentine camps in the great forests of Longleaf Pine, 
Warehouses stacked with barrels of tar, turpentine stills, and tools and equipment are all put to the torch, and inevitably the thick stands of highly volatile pine trees catch fire. The route of the march is marked by gouts of flaming forest and plumes of thick, tarry smoke. All along the way, newly freed blacks appear in great numbers, as if springing from the land itself. They sing and shout their liberation and fall in behind the marching soldiers. The blue columns cross the PD, the Lumber, and the Cape Fear, the cavalry scouting ahead. At Monroe's Crossroads on March 10th, 15 miles south of Fayetteville, Kilpatrick's cavalrymen are surprised in their beds by the dawn attack of Wade Hampton's cavalry. Buying time so Johnson's main force can concentrate ahead of Sherman. In the fierce skirmish that follows, the Union cavalry is first routed, then regroups and counterattacks. The Union troopers fend off one of the last great cavalry charges of the Confederacy. Both commanders exaggerate the enemy's casualties and minimize their own, but by any count, the dead and wounded and captured number in the hundreds. The following day, Sherman occupies Fayetteville and establishes his headquarters at the arsenal. The arsenal is a magisterial structure, both beautiful and functional, occupying almost 100 acres of meadows shaded by stands of hardwood. The main citadel, which took more than 20 years to build and was only completed on the eve of war, is a fortress 500 feet by 500 feet with guard towers rising four stories high at the corners. The brick and sandstone walls are painted in a yellow wash, and inside, the doors are mahogany, strapped with brass hinges and locks, not the usual wrought iron. It's a showplace, but also a factory that has turned out for the Confederacy 10,000 Fayetteville model rifled muskets and nearly a million paper-wrapped cartridges, along with gun carriages, artillery fuses, and ramrods. 4,000 people work at the arsenal, including the women who make the cartridges. The people of Fayetteville regard it as a civic monument, and on weekends and holidays the grounds are crowded with picnickers and strolling couples. Sherman writes Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, I cannot leave a detachment to hold it, and therefore I shall burn it, blow it up with gunpowder, and then with rams knock down its walls. I take it for granted the United States will never again trust Carolina with an arsenal to appropriate at her pleasure. Of course, there's Fort Bragg, but... <laughs> He is wary of his old adversary Johnston, who even now is concentrating the remnants of the Army of Tennessee, coastal artillery units from Charleston and elsewhere, Hoax and Haygood's Wilmington troops, and junior reserves on ground in Sherman's path. Johnston, the highest ranking U.S. Army officer to resign his commission at the start of the war, fought Sherman from Chattanooga to Atlanta, defeating him at Kennesaw Mountain, Georgia, and inflicting 3,000 casualties. Sherman calls it the hardest fight of the campaign up to that date. To Colonel Orlando M. Poe and the 1,000 men of the 1st Michigan Engineers fall the task of destruction. They spend March 12th smashing with sledgehammers whatever equipment they can find inside the walls of the armory. The rest has been spirited off to be secret and secreted in coal mines in Egypt and Chatham County. Next day, they rig railroad ties as battering rams and knock down the walls. Finally, on the third day, they dynamite the remains and set them on fire. The flames burn so high and hot, the wind whips the fire to neighboring homes and they too burn. The arsenal's outbuildings burn. Sherman's men fire warehouses and cotton mills, confiscating whatever they can use. An army comrade from pre-war days seeks out Sherman at his headquarters, pleads with his old friend to spare his property. Sherman tells him, you are here a traitor, and you ask me to be again your friend, to protect your property? Turn your back to me forever. Sherman, no friend to even northern newspaper reporters, holds the Fayetteville Observer in special contempt. Not only has it been a loud champion of the Confederate cause, but its stories have been reprinted far and wide across the South, a custom of the time. Editor Edward Jones Hale manages to rescue plates and some printing equipment, but his son, Edward Joseph Hale, writes what happens next. His office, with everything in it, was burned by Sherman's order. Slocum, who executed the order with a number of other generals, sat on the veranda of a hotel opposite watching the progress of the flames while they hobnobbed over wine stolen from our cellar. A fine brick building adjacent, also belonging to my father, was burned at the same time. 
Hale continues his damning account. You have doubtless heard of Sherman's bummers. The Yankees would have you believe they're only straggling pillagers, usually found with all armies. Several letters written by officers of Sherman's army intercepted near this town give this the lie. And some of these letters were descriptions of the whole bumming process. And from them it appears it was highly organized under the authority of General Sherman himself that one-fifth of the proceeds fell to General Sherman, another one-fifth to the other general officers, another one-fifth to the line officers, and the remaining two-fifths to the enlisted men. There were pure silver bummers, plated wear bummers, jewelry bummers, women's clothing bummers, provision bummers, and in fine, a bummer or bummers for every kind of stealable thing. No bummer of one specialty interfering with the sellables of another. Stealable, sorry, of another. A pretty picture of a conquering army indeed, but true. The steamboat Davidson arrives from Wilmington, now in Union hands, and Sherman opens regular communication with General Terry, whose troops plan to rendezvous with Sherman in Goldsboro, along with General Schofield's regiments from New Bern by steamboat and mule train. Sherman sends 25,000 camp followers, mostly liberated slaves, downriver to Wilmington. He writes to Terry, they are dead weight to me and consume our supplies. The old sentimental Sherman. <laughs> Meantime, he orders Terry, I want you to send me all the shoes, stocking, drawers, sugar, coffee, and flour you can spare. Finish the loads with oats of corn, or corn. Have the boats escorted and have them run at night at any risk. The retreating Confederates burn the Clarendon Bridge across the Cape Fear, but in less than a day, Union engineers lay down pontoon bridges. After a three-day sojourn, Sherman quits Fayetteville, now a ruined city, and leads his army across the river where the enemy is waiting. So the book goes on to talk about what happened that these battles that happened, one at Aversboro, a sort of a holding action, and then later on a, a, a much larger, bloodier battle at Bentonville. And at last, Sherman has chased uh, Johnston back toward Raleigh and finally Durham. And just before the great surrender, um, it's learned that Abraham Lincoln has been killed. No one knows this. Sherman hides the fact from his own army because he's afraid that some, if the word gets out, they will sack and destroy Raleigh and any other city they come to. He understands that. So he keeps it secret, but he does tell when he meets Johnston on the uh, Hillsborough Road, Hillsborough uh, Durham Road at the Bennett Place, he does begin their conversation on April 17th by saying, um, before we start this, I just got this telegram as he was getting on the train literally to come over there. And at that point, you have to understand that all, everybody in the War Department in Washington assumed that this was a plot hatched by the Confederate government, not a lone actor. Uh, and so what basically Sherman says is if we don't do this, if we don't get this done, I will shortly be in no position to help you. But it still takes nine days, and it's a whole other story you can read about in the book. The thing I love about this is what began in disobedience ends in disobedience. That is, both generals disobey their governments finally to make peace. Grant disobeys his government to help out Sherman. And Johnston and Sherman, who have fought each other across Georgia and the Carolinas, but have never actually met, become friends for life. And they both serve as pallbearers at Grant's funeral. All right, so now I'm going to sing a couple of songs, and then we can talk. So one of the things that I dealt with in uh, spending four years, 51 installments, and then two more years making this into a book, which I thought would be a matter of simply doing just that, putting a cover on it and saying, here, uh, it and then after that, I actually personally hired two fact checkers. The press had two very terrific historians review it. One of them, Mark Bradley, was especially helpful. And of course, they had their own editor, copy editor, proofreader, and so it was, it was a long time coming. But the process left me feeling, especially the original magazine reporting, feeling almost as though I'd gone into the war because the premise that I approached the whole project with was, I'm not doing this in the way that a settled historian might, looking back, kind of knowing all the context, how it all turned out. My project was different. I wanted to capture the war in Teddy Roosevelt's words about writing history as if it were present. I wanted to try to capture, if I could, that true and terrifying suspense that the people endured because they did not know how it was going to turn out. 
They did not know if their sons or brothers or fathers or husbands would come home from the war. They did not know if economically they would survive the devastation. They did not know what the Union Army would do once it invaded North Carolina, which it did, ironically, not from the north. It never invaded from the north. It came from the sea coast, the east, it came from the west. Stoneman with the 6,000 troopers over the mountains, and then he came from the south with Sherman's gigantic army. And so it was pushing it up against Virginia. And I, so I wanted to kind of, when I got all done the series, I wrote some songs about, actually I wrote them while I was doing it, but this one I wrote at the very end as I was trying to sum up for myself kind of the emotions that were going on. And you notice that it begins with a kind of a bugle call. When I do this with my band, Whiskey Creek, Deb Ross, who's our fiddler, does it on the fiddle, and it will bring you to tears. But you'll just hear guitar strings tonight. The long gray line has broken now. The bugle sounds retreat. The final lord has spoken now. The final word, defeat. And out across the killing ground, all stained in blue and gray. A sigh of wind, the only sound, as night falls over day. The stars and stripes forever waves. The stars and bars no more North and south the Union save A nation done with war We welcome you our brothers It's time to make our peace Let us cross over the river And rest in the shade of the trees Marched away in fine array, all full of manly pride. We would prevail, how could we fail when God was on our side? The slave has shaken off his chains, and now at last is free. How many good men died to claim his share of liberty? Know that hard days lie ahead now let us take our ease let us cross over the river and rest in the shade of the trees we welcome you our brothers it's time we made our peace let us cross over the river and rest in the shade of the trees. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how many of you recognize the tagline of uh, let us cross over the river and rest in the shade of the trees. It's a little bit of a corruption of the last words of, of uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. He said, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees, but I couldn't make the syllables work. So. I thought it was fitting that such a gentle uh, last word of parting should come from such a bloodthirsty general. Um, the other, we welcome you, our brothers, when the prisoners who had been freed from Salisbury Prison, a notorious prison that I never knew about until I started writing the series, uh, they survived, many did not, but they came uh, to the northeast branch of the Cape Fear, were ferried across. Many were naked, many had very few clothes on their backs. Um, they were starving. Private Benjamin Booth had lost 90 pounds in captivity and was a skeleton. And as these men, many of them bleeding, broken, sick, uh, injured, gaunt, starving, many had been tortured, many uh, had been wounded, and their wounds gone uncared for. As they crossed the river into the lines, they were met by members of the USCT, the US Colored Troops, who literally, and they had a big banner erected across the road that said, we welcome you, our brothers. And they literally gave them the shirts off their backs. And they gave them water and food. And Benjamin Booth reported um, that it was a, a very emotional time for everybody and many tears were shed. 
But I find that to be a beautiful thing. We welcome you, our brother. So I put that in the song. Now, I'll shift gears a little bit. There was a very jaunty song that was played by both armies. And it comes from a tune and a, and a series of words that were learned by American soldiers from British Grenadier prisoners during the War of 1812. And what then happened, of course, with the tune is everybody makes up their own words to it. And so this was a popular tune, but it's very jaunty. And you probably recognize it. And then I'll, my response comes from reading the many, many letters that women wrote to their husbands, their brothers, to Governor Late in the war, women in North Carolina were basically saying, can't you come home? We're starving. The kids need you. The crops are rotting. But this is the song. Well, I put my knapsack on my back, rifle on my shoulder. I headed down to Campbelltown, and they made me a soldier. Girl, I left. Girl, I left. Girl, I left behind. If ever I see that girl again, I'll swing her up behind me. Well, last night I slept in a sycamore tree, the wind and the rain about me. Tonight I'll sleep in a warm feather bed with the girl I left behind me. Girl, I left. Girl, I left. Girl, I left behind me. Tonight I'll sleep in a warm feather bed with the girl I left behind me. Well, U.S. Grant and Bobby Lee are fighting in Virginia. Me, I'm gonna stay right here and find the love that's in ya. Girl, I left. Girl, I left. Girl, I left behind. If ever I see that girl again, I'll swing her up behind me. So I wanted to write a song from the women's point of view. These are the men jaunting off, having a jolly time of it. I am the girl you left behind, so loving and so true. While you are fighting on the line, I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Oh, I will wait for you. While you are waiting on the line, I will wait for you. At night when you lay down to sleep, I will pray for you. Pray the Lord your soul to keep until the morning dew. Until the morning dew. Until the morning dew. I will pray the Lord your soul to keep until the morning dew. You are the husband of my heart, your mother's only son. So come you safely home to me and all your little ones, all your little ones, all your little ones. Oh, come you safely home to me and all your little ones. And keep your body safe from harm. Don't fall among the brave dead. Honor will not keep me warm, nor medals fill my lonely bed. Write a letter home, my dear, and speak of better times. When this cruel war is over, and once again you're mine. Once again you're mine, oh once again you're mine, when this cruel war is over, and once again you're mine. So I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments or critiques you may have. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a comment and ask a question. Mm -hmm. I've heard you on the Frank Stacio show during the week. Oh, Frank Stacio, yeah, he's a good guy. Thank you. Thank you for the shout out. That's why I'm here because I'm going to hear more from you. But I would like to ask you to talk about the role that African Americans played in. Freeing the slaves and freeing us 
I would, I would love to ask, the, the question is about the role that African Americans played in freeing slaves and helping, and, and that's actually one of the great surprises. I learned in this project that pretty much everything I thought I knew about the Civil War was either outright wrong or only right in a qualified, very complicated way. One of the things that the narrative that we usually get, you know, at least certainly I got in grade school was, well, there were these slaves down south and these blue guys in blue coats went down and freed them and that's that. But in fact, um, there were many African American leaders in North Carolina, most famously people like um, who famously recruited three regiments of black soldiers and Sherman ended up with a fourth, but 5,000 mostly former slaves were serving in the Union Army fighting in combat and in fact um, I'm working with the Cameron Art Museum now, they're putting up a piece of, we're trying to put up um, a kind of statuary piece of, of real art to honor the USCT that came up the Wilmington Peninsula and helped to uh, turn that battle and who actually were the ones who won the day at Fort Fisher, the famous battle of Fort Fisher that you see in the movie Lincoln. But it wasn't just confined to that. Even long before the war, there were networks of enslaved people on plantations in the Cape Fear, the Roanoke, uh, and other rivers where all the plantations were typically located in the uh, coastal and Piedmont areas. And they had whole networks helping each other escape. And there were, they were uh, cadres of blacks living in the swamps where they couldn't be touched. They were well armed and nobody messed with them. They would even come in and work in the turpentine stills for pay. And the turpentine still managers needed them. They were out in, in the forest alone, and they would look the other way and just pay them. And then when they come back and, and want more work, they'd pay them again. So there was a huge operation already going on that was invisible to the white plantation owners and their ilk. And in fact, in one of the things that happens late in the war, which I talk about, you would think that by the middle of the war after Gettysburg, it would be clear that slavery is going to go the way of the dodo, that it is no longer a viable thing. The South can't possibly win the war at that point. Pretty much everybody in any position of power understands this. But the slave owners, suddenly slaves are a huge commodity again, and the prices actually go up and the trading goes up. And there's all kind of speculation. You have to understand at the start of the war that slaves were the single greatest economic asset in the U.S. Bigger than railroads, bigger than factories, bigger than farms, bigger than mercantile trade, slaves. So when the, when, uh, the war was coming, closing in on eastern North Carolina, uh, the governor, Governor Zebulon Vance, ordered that as many slaves as could be taken from coastal areas likely to be captured should be sent out west. And this had the effect of actually strengthening a very subversive resistant movements in the West. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the activity of, say, helping Union soldiers escape capture, of getting slaves who are already on the run to freedom, of stymieing efforts by the Home Guard, all those subversive things was kind of its own underground. It was sort of like the French underground, except it was black and it was happening in Western North Carolina. So the, the narrative that somehow slaves sat around and waited to be rescued is a myth. And those 25,000 that Sherman had attached to his army, uh, only some small fraction of them had been actually liberated by patrols. Most of them had liberated themselves and found the army and were headed north. Many others, of course, had congregated at New Bern and crossed over the lines, which was a very dangerous thing to do. Um, but you, uh, you, know, you had people voting with their feet. So I'm glad you asked that question because I think as historians are looking at the war in a different light now, the role of African Americans in the army, out of the army, free and slave, all were hugely important to how the war was finally won. And it's probably no exaggeration to say that without the U.S. colored troops, USCT as they called them, the war would not have been over when it was over. They were like the final push that was able to add the manpower that Grant needed. And they participated in some very bloody battles, both in Wilmington and in places in Virginia like the Crater by Petersburg. So they... Are they, yeah, in the back. Uh, yes, could you uh, speak a bit or elaborate on the Unionist experience in North Carolina? You, uh... Yeah, the North Carolina, one of the, the great things about North Carolina as a state to look at is that it really was several. So the mountains you had kind of equally divided. Uh, my friend Ron Rash, and all of us, we were, we were driving out, I think it was through Madison County at some point, and there was some, some guy had a Confederate flag flying from the flagpole, and Ron looked at me and he goes, well, my, he said, that boy had done that in 1865, he'd have been hanged. And he said, my granddaddy would have done the hanging. <laughs> 
<laughs> lots of counties in western North Carolina were so pro-unionist that the war in the West really became a kind of a Hatfield-McCoy affair. It really became feuds. Um, most famously and most grisly at Shelton Laurel where the Confederate soldiers murdered 13 men and boys that they'd captured to come out in the woods and killed them and thought that was the end of it except some very fierce women, namely the sisters, wives, and daughters of the men who were killed, went and found the bodies, brought them back, and raised holy hell both to the governor and finally to the halls of the U.S. Congress after the war. So even though that was one of many atrocities that happened, we know about that one because there's a paperwork trail, many boxes and you know, 20 linear feet of paperwork or whatever on it. Um, in the East, it was the so-called buffaloes augmented by Wild's African Legion, which were actually mostly made up of freed slaves, many from the area on the coast, who were actually going out and now raiding the very plantations that had once held them in captivity and bondage. They were really valuable to Wild because they recognized everybody. And they could say, that guy's a unionist, that, that guy's not. <laughs> That guy's a union, is those two over there? No, not so much. So they were able to give them a really fine intelligence about who was trustworthy, who wasn't. But the unionists, it, w it was split pretty much down the middle of the white population in North Carolina, about 50-50. Historians argue that maybe there's a slight edge to the Unionists, but the people that owned the land and the slaves and the power were on the Confederate side. And of course, 330,000 enslaved people had nothing to say about the matter. So they clearly weren't in the Confederate camp. So when you talk about heritage, it's really a, a very mixed heritage. You also had, um, in some of the middle counties, you had a huge band of Quakers who were simply against the war. They weren't going to fight for anybody. They were not particularly sympathetic to the Confederate cause, but they were not going to take up arms. But they were therefore not only useless to the Confederate cause, but they were a positive irritant. You had, uh, I think I mentioned the Heroes of America, 10,000 people spread across the middle of the Piedmont, whose stated aim in life was to disrupt the Confederacy and lose the war for them. And they had adopted very Masonic rituals of greeting. They wore a little red string. And they had a little red piece on their door lintel so you could tell who was a hero of America and who wasn't. Um, you had uh, William Holden, who actually, ironically, had been the newspaper editor who'd gotten Zebulon Vance elected governor. Vance wasn't even campaigning. He was in the Army. He was leading the 26th North Carolina at that point. And he, he said coyly something on the order of, well, I'm not going to run for governor because I've got a job. But, you know, if you really need me, you really want me, I guess, you know, I'll sort of do it. So he ends up being elected in a landslide, but then Holden and he have a falling out. And Holden has the position later in the war, uh, soon after Gettysburg, that all is lost. And that if North Carolina does not want to suffer invasion and devastation the way certain other states have, that they need to sue for a separate peace, which would, of course, destroy the Confederacy because North Carolina is square between Virginia and the rest of it. So, but the Union has played a huge role and they were about half the state. Uh, not so much on the coast. Sherman expected to find a lot more support than he did, but he marched to the wrong part of the state. Had he gone a little further west or a little further east, he probably would have done okay. But he, he went right into the heart of Confederate sympathizers in plantation country. Other questions? Yes. The relationship between uh, Generals uh, Sherman and Grant and then, uh, then fought out the President, did that was an edge and flow? No. The question is about whether President or whether Grant and uh, and Sherman had ebbs and flows in their friendship. As far as I can determine, no. They decided early on they were going to be soulmates, and I think it was uh, was it Sherman who said, you know, um, you stood by me while I was crazy. I'll stand by you while you're drunk, because Sherman had actually had a nervous breakdown and been committed after the early part of the fighting. They had something else in common, which is really important when you're looking at the Civil War. They were not military men in the strict sense that, say, Lee was or Johnston or a lot of the Confederates. They, they didn't really believe in the concept of honor and glory on the battlefield. They were very pragmatic. They wanted to get the, they saw it as a dirty job and they were going to get it done as efficiently, as ruthlessly as they had to, to go home. And the other thing they had in common was they both had a great ability to learn from their mistakes. And there were many, many Civil War commanders who did not have that trait. And they kept doing the same stupid 
stupid thing over and over again. The definition of insanity, right, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting for a different result. And Sherman learned after a few battles that the frontal charge without flanking, without the proper intelligence, a cold harbor being sort of his come to Jesus moment, is, um, you know, he learns. And Sherman was very hard on himself. He thought early in the war he had made blunder after blunder, and he determined to change his tactics and his ability to command in order to become a better general. But as far as I know, their friendship was unwavering. After the war, in the Grand Administration, Sherman actually becomes Chief of Staff of the Army, the most powerful military figure. And Grant was, by that point, a god by the time he had elected president. So, yes, sir. So I was going to ask on the, the divide, the 50, 50 divide for succession. And those numbers are including women and the numbers. Well, it, it's usually taken by the... Um, uh, it, it's done two ways. One is by the actual vote in county by county for secession. The, the uh, secession convention vote fails in North Carolina. And it's only when Lincoln says we have to have troops and send them into the South that they can rally enough forces. And then, of course, uh, historians have done lots of work on which counties were loyal, and they could pretty well extrapolate from the data that if the men in your family were Confederates or, or Unionists, you were probably that too. Inside of uh, nuclear families, you weren't necessarily going to find that level of divide. And, and one thing, you know, one of the things I learned in doing this was pretty much any fact I found, the next fact contradicted it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got a text on the way over here that um, somebody was talking about the name of the Bennett Farm, and when I started writing the book, it was, it was spelled with an E. By the time I finished the book and it was coming out, they had decided that the proper spelling that the family used was I. <laughs> right. When I started the book, the most accurate estimate of Civil War battle casualties and deaths by um, disease among soldiers was around 620,000. By the time I finished the book, the new estimate is around 850,000. And I fully expect that within my lifetime it'll rise to a million. Now, nobody's still fighting, as far as I know. <laughs> it, it was in all the papers. The war did end <laughs> in 1865. But the, the metrics by which we can measure the tools and the, the discoveries we're making of graves we didn't know about every time there's a new shopping center that goes in. You know, e even at Gettysburg, they, they still keep finding remains of people. You know, so I think that number is likely to rise. And I think nobody's ever made a proper accounting of either enslaved people, free black, uh, civilians, people that fall through the cracks of the official military counting apparatus. So, yes, in the back. Yeah. What was the motivation for the heroes for America? Were they abolitionists? The heroes of America, the motivation for them was simply they did not believe in the Confederacy, they thought it was treasonous, and they decided to band together and do whatever they could to subvert it. And some of it was quite benign, some of it was simply spreading misinformation, some of it was helping uh, Union soldiers who had been captured escape, sometimes they're actually sabotaging railroad trestles, so it was a range of things. And it's, it's probably not quite as organized as it sounds when I talk about it, but it was at least 10,000 people who officially had a membership in it. And they Actually, a lot sorry. of them based on Randolph County, right? I think that's where it actually started, Randolph yeah. Randolph County, um, we're in the 7th of February, 1861, voting 98% of the state of the Union. Right. Um, very Quaker part of North Carolina. So you, you do have uh, very solid counties, very solid regions, very solid towns in the Union camp, and that's, that's where it arises from. Yes, back here. Um, you seem to allude, you alluded to um, Appomattox not really being as important as what was going on with uh, Johnson's surrender to Sherman. Could you enlighten us as to why that is? Sure, and actually, I'll, I'll say that a little differently. The question is about Appomattox versus the surrender at Bennett Place. I think App Appomattox was hugely important. It was the defeat of the Army of Northern Virginia, which had been, to that point, the focus of the fighting uh, in, the, in the East. And what I said was it wasn't the end by any stretch, and an abiding mystery is that by that point in the war, Robert E. Lee was virtually a dictator. In fact, there were people that wanted him to become the dictator of the Confederacy and save it. And he was the, uh, the overall commander of all the forces of the Confederacy. So ha 
had he wished to, in theory, he could have surrendered the entire thing and said, you know what, we're done, we're not going to kill anybody else. But he surrendered 29,000 odd troops that were in danger of annihilation, imminent, they would have been pretty much massacred had he allowed the battle to go forward. So he saved those men, but then he left 90,000, three times that many combat troops in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. And there were a few others in Alabama, and a few, but they were in negligible numbers across in the West. I mean, the, the reason Sherman came east from Atlanta in the first place was there was nobody left to fight out there. He had this gigantic army, and he thought, well, let's go find somebody to fight with it, and so brought it to the coast. He considered that just a redeployment. And then going up the coast was when he did a lot of his fighting, when he came to North Carolina. Well, this would happen two weeks later, too, after, after. Yeah, I mean, the fighting went on, and there were battles. I mean, you know, Bentonville was a huge, bloody battle. Lots of people got killed, maimed, wounded, captured, um, and there was still lots of suffering to be had. And uh, I talked about disobedience. The plan was what Jefferson Davis, who by this point, according to the testimony of both John Breckinridge and Johnston, was clearly becoming unhinged and untrustworthy. They felt, they felt he was no longer in his right mind. He kept saying, we're going to take the infantry to the mountains, and we're, we'll stage a guerrilla war while we re-recruit from all the people that are left to recruit. And Johnston is saying, there's nobody left. He's taken the boys. He's taken the old men. You know, we've got, we've got people who have one arm that are in the army. And there's nobody out there. And what we have are, are deserting by the day. Um, but Jefferson had already ordered that stores be laid along the route to the mountains so that as the infantry marched to the mountains they would have depots, caches of food and, and shelter and, and uh, ammunition. And for his part, Sherman was ordered to annihilate Johnston. They basically said, we're done with all this. You know, Lincoln's dead, go get him and, and put them all on the ground. And he thought that was an abominable order too. So the two of them together concoct a surrender which is then refused by both of their governments. And Sherman, uh, Grant rather, comes down a few days later, is ordered by the War Department to sack Sherman. In fact, they want to put him under arrest for treason because he's called off Stoneman, who was raiding with his troopers. And, and Secretary Stanton is now questioning, publicly questioning, Sherman's loyalty. And Grant disobeys all them, and he says, no, he sticks by his friend. And he says, I'll tell you what, go and give them the same terms they got at Appomattox, and that'll be it, and everybody will take that. And so by this time, Jefferson Davis has left in the middle of the night and gone, not told anybody where he's headed. He's going to Greensboro, and then and further on, oh, he's in Greensboro, he's going further on out of Charlotte, and then down south. And there's one sticking point, that Johnston won't sign the surrender. He says, when Lee surrendered in Virginia, 30,000 men walked back to their homes without food or transportation, and they raised holy hell among the civilian countryside. And you cannot let 90,000 men, including the 25,000 or so he had right there in Durham, we cannot have that. They can't, we just can't let these guys loose on the countryside. It would be, that would be worse than the war. At least here in camp, I have my command control over them. And, but they couldn't put it in the surrender because they were expressly forbidden from putting terms like that. And so John Schofield, who was going to become the commander of the Department of North Carolina after the war, says, you know what, let's, let's not worry about it. Just sign the surrender. I have an idea. And he came up with a very lawyerly solution. He said, let's just craft a second document. And that will cover this. And in the document, we'll say, we'll give you railroad passage, we'll give you horses and mules, we'll, you know, all that stuff, along with food. And so that was it. The surrender was one thing, a separate document for that. Uh, Grant, Sherman was very generous, both to the army he had just defeated and the, the inhabitants. He ordered that all mules and horses that they did not need in the army would be, could quietly be given to farmers. Um, he let the officers keep their sidearms, as, as Grant had done. And so there's a, there's a strangely honorable and gentle ending to a war that had become extremely dishonorable and anything but gentle for four years. And then it ended in the friendship of the two men who made it happen. That's the part I love. Yes? Uh, I come from curiosity. Uh, I'm from Alabama. Uh, Alabama is the you can be in my writing class anytime. <laughs> my question and concern is I've heard and been inspired by the presence of your enthusiasm you have the future. What are we going to learn from this? I hear all the facts and figures we go to the places. 20, 30 years from now, we create a place where we dialogue and be brothers, sisters, once and for all. I'm going to be a last war. Why can't a place like this become a place? 
Yes. The, the question is, what, what about the future? Can this place, and by that I mean the, the Civil War Center, the Civil Reconstruction Center, be a place of dialogue and problem solving? I think yes. Absolutely, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I believe that every community is built on stories. The stories tell us who we are, what we value, how we got here, and they embody the values of what we want to teach our children going forward. So we, if we tell a story that is about honor and honesty and gentleness and forbearance and empathy, that's the story that will define us. If we tell a story based on other values, not so much. I think the great advantage of writing about history, and I'm not a historian, I'm a writer, but writing about history allows you to take things that are extremely um, volatile, race relations being probably the third rail of all American political discourse. But we can go back 150 years and say, let's just take all you, all, anybody who's alive now is out of the picture. Let's go back and see what we can learn from the way they made the decisions they made and how those decisions didn't work out so well and see if there's a different course. And so in talking about it in the context, not of our lives and politics, but in, in theirs, we can have a certain remove from it and take some of the heat away from the discussion and get towards some of the light. I think that's what the center is all about. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. You've been a great audience. I, I see that there's still so I, will, I will be back there to sign anybody or talk further with you. And thanks so much for coming out. I really appreciate it.